This is Scott Monsifon. Um, we do have quite a bit of ground to cover today, and I'll jump right in. Um, so we're going to review a few things that's listed on the agenda, um, but I'm going to take a real focus on the components that will lead to your success in submitting your data. We will then take an even closer look at both um, the data files and the way they're structured. Please note that as we make our way through the various sections, um, I will take time and pause for questions. You can send your questions to us via um, the pod that um, Lisa just described, the Q&A pod um, within your uh, Adobe connection. So for this particular submission window, um, so this is the fall 2018 data submission window, and we're collecting data for the spring and summer terms of the 2017 and 18 academic year. Um, we will distribute a questionnaire to you. Um, some of you have probably received a questionnaire in the past, um, and some of you may be new to PDP and will receive it for the first time. Um, so I'll share a few of the questions that are on the questionnaire. Um, we would like to know the threshold for the number of credits that a student would have to take in a given term to be considered full-time at your institution. And we would like to know that for um, both the regular terms as well as the summer terms. For our frontier set friends who have um, previously submitted data to us, um, what we require from you is an updated term grid for the entire academic year of 2017-18. Some of you had already submitted that information to us with your previous submission, but others were not able to provide um, the spring and summer dates at that time. So if you were amongst that group, um, please do send us an updated term grid. And of course, if there are any changes to the um, credit thresholds at your institutions or perhaps the grade scale, you can include those changes as well. Um, and please do return these to us by September 30th. Um, the questionnaire will be distributed at the end of this week. Um, this is an example of what the grade scale um, looks like. Uh, we do want to know what grade scale you use at your institution. Um, there are more options to choose from than the ones you see here. Um, on the far left, um, where it says scale, uh, you can either, if, if the scale matches what you use at your institutions, you can just give us that numeric ID. Um, if it does not, you can then follow the same format and just enter a um, term grid into the attachment that we will distribute to you along with the questionnaire and return that to us. I'll pause briefly here um, if you have any questions. Okay. So what we'll need, um, so for those submitting the data for the first time, please send us your cohort and course data starting with the 2011 to 12 uh, cohort and onwards. Please note that if you're part of the frontier set and participated in the spring data submission, we want to thank you for providing us your historical data then. Um, so the clearinghouse is now collecting three data files. Um, the cohort file, which it, um, for this particular submission window should include all students that enrolled at your respective institution during the 2017-18 spring and summer terms. The course file, um, which is a cumulative file, you want to list courses taken in the 2017-18 academic spring and summer terms for all students that you've included in any of your current and past cohorts. The Clearinghouse is also opening the collection of the um, financial aid data file. Um, this is an optional file, um, whereas the cohort and course files are required. Um, please note that this is also a cumulative file. Please include data that is relevant to the 2017-18 academic year for all students that you've included in any of your current or past cohorts. And last, um, please continue sending your enrollment and degree data through other clearinghouse services. Again, I'll pause here briefly for any questions. Uh, it looks like we do have a question now. Um, if you've already sent in data before, do, do you have to fill out the questionnaire again? Um, so when you receive the questionnaire, um, and if you want to just look at your previous submission to us, just ensure that you did include the um, spring and summer terms of 2017-18. A few schools from the Frontier set at that time were not able to provide us those, those dates. Um, so if you have provided them, then no, you do not have to worry about them resubmitting the questionnaire. All right. Um, so next, we're going to dive into the various sections of the submission guide. Um, again, it is of extreme importance that you review it in its entirety carefully um, prior to programming your data files. 
Uh, we certainly expect questions as you begin your programming, and I encourage you to reach out to us early and often. So focusing on the files, um, the files must be provided in a comma-separated flat file format. Um, they must contain a file header, column headers, and the detail records, which is the actual data. And finally, a trailer that concludes the file. In just a few slides, we will take a closer look at those specific requirements. So we'll go over how the data elements are defined. Um, you're given a sequence number, uh, which is the order in which each data element must appear in, on your file. This is followed by the name of the data element. This is al also what you would name the respective column headers in your file. Uh, we'll show you an example of that in a moment. Um, but please note that they must be spelled exactly as they are written in the guide, and they are case sensitive. So again, for our um, Frontier Set friends, um, when you take the financial aid file into consideration, again, please note that those column headers must be spelled out exactly as they appear in the guide. Um, the format and type of each data element is provided as well. Um, alpha means they can only be at alphabet characters, um, numeric is numbers only, alpha and numeric is a combination of each, and a string element means that basically anything goes. Um, an enumerated field is multiple choice. Uh, it is a constraint field that only accepts certain values. The data types are rather strict. Um, as an example, if it's defined as an alpha field, then no numbers, special characters, or even spaces are allowed unless otherwise indicated. The length indicates the maximum number of characters allowed in a given field. Uh, we identify which fields are required, not required, or conditional listed as Y for yes, required, and for no, not required, and CY for conditionally um, yes, required. Uh, the definition is actually a written description of the field. Um, please read each carefully. Um, some are brief, others like the definition of the cohort field are very descriptive. Um, the cohort field definition will explain what student population should be included in your file submission. The allowed values for an enumerated field will tell you what exactly you're allowed to enter in said field. For other types of fields, it may indicate that some special characters or spaces are allowed. And last but not least, the validation and business rules define further constraints around a field. Okay, so in the submission guide, um, we're looking at the header record layout. Um, this is how the data definition tables appear. Um, this is used, so this particular table is used to identify the file type and the sender of the file. The first column is the sequence, which explains what order the field must be in. Um, please note one small nuance for the next column. The variable name is informational, and it is not a column header. There will be a sample in the next slide, which should make this a little bit more clear. Uh, we then have the format, um, the maximum length limit, the required flag, and the description of the field, followed closely by the allowed values and validation rules. Again, this particular table is just for the file header of your file. Um, some important items to take a note of, please. Um, unique to the file header and trailer are the concept of filler fields. We simply ask that you insert a comma separator or, from an Excel point of view, add a blank column for these types of fields. Um, additionally, the service account ID is something that we provide to you. Um, it's an enterprise system ID that is generated once you receive your executed contract and activate your service. Um, so again, for Frontier Set um, friends, um, you've already received your service ID and you may continue using that um, numeric ID. Uh, for the organization ID, if you are a system that is submitting data on behalf of multiple institutions, then this is an organizational uh, this, this is an organization ID that the clearinghouse will provide to you. Um, and if you're an institution, then this is your six-digit OPE ID, um, including leading zeros. Oops, pardon. Um, and last but not least, the branch code. Um, as of now, uh, nobody is utilizing the branch code, um, so you can just enter two zeros to um, populate that field. This is a sample of what the file header would look like if viewed in a Word editor, um, like Notepad. Here we see the various elements that were defined, um, as well as the filler fields. Um, so please note that there are no variable names or column headers. It starts with the record type, then it moves to the service account, um, the organization ID, the branch code, 
the filler fields, um, a file certified date, uh, it skipped another um, filler field in the middle, and then we have the um, file client ID. Any questions? All right, so we have um, direction on how to create a flat file. Um, so since every institution is probably using a different um, SIS or um, other type of system to produce their files, um, what we're looking for is really a text file or a CSV um, extension file. Um, that's the type of file we're looking for. And then we have an additional question um, for a copy of the submission guide. So we do have the submission guide um, in the resource links. Um, I think it's a pod that you'll be able to see right now in the um, Adobe session that you're in. Um, they're also on our public um, PDP webpage um, under the resources section. All right, um, so now uh, we're going to look at the detailed record layout. Um, so this is where we're defining the data elements for each individual student um, in the cohort file. Um, the cohort file itself is at the student level, and we expect a single record per student. The data elements must be listed in the exact sequence as defined. Um, the nuance I've mentioned um, previously, where in the file header we refer to the second column as a variable name, it is now called a column header. That means the name of the data element becomes the column header itself, and it must be spelled out exactly as it is in the submission guide, um, including case sensitivity. Uh, we're going to look at a sample a little bit later that will make this more clear. Um, we'll now take a closer look at some of this, uh, of some sample data elements from the cohort file. Um, so these are the cohort itself. Um, please read the description of the cohort carefully. Um, we are defining the student population that should be included in your data. Um, one question we've been asked multiple times um, all about uh, dual enrolled students. Um, we ask that you do not include dual enrolled students that are still in high school as part of your cohort. For Social Security and Student ID, um, they are conditionally required, meaning that we require at least one of them. Uh, we certainly prefer both as we most likely already have a student's social security number due to um, the enrollment reporting that your registrar uh, participates in with the clearinghouse. Um, so that's our best way to match the student um, that you sent to us against existing data. So we do prefer both. But again, I just want to point out that it's a conditionally required field. So if you give us the student ID, you do not technically have to give us a social security number. And if you have any concerns about including the social security number in your um, data submission to us directly, um, please let us know and we'll do our best to address your concerns. For the street line um, 1 and 2 and um, city, uh, we do have a maximum character length that you will likely exceed in some cases. Um, both domestic and international addresses can exceed these fields. Um, if they do, we ask that you please trim those addresses down to the maximum allowed length. We understand that this actually decreases the validity of that address, um, but we're tied to this character um, length limit because of the way our enrollment and degree data is stored. For ethnicity and race, um, we're collecting these elements per the Department of Education guidelines published um, post-2007. Um, some key items to note. Uh, we learned of instances where a student has been identified as an ethnicity of Hispanic and also a race of Hispanic. Um, in such cases, please use the identifier of Hispanic for ethnicity and unknown for race. In our reporting logic that creates the outcomes um, and the way we categorize students, Hispanic ethnicity would um, trump any other, um, the ethnicity itself of Hispanic would trump any race related um, categories. So by um, identifying the race as unknown, you're not um, necessarily putting a student into an um, incorrect bucket of any kind. Um, additionally, the race field is unique in structure. Um, it's a multi-valued variable, and it's enumerated. So you have a list of allowed values for the various races, and you may elect more than one using a pipe delimiter to separate each value. We have um, refined our submission guide um, since the last version that had been published, and we have um, a clear example of what that should look like in the submission guide. Oops, pardon. Uh, the institution ID and institution ID value are used to identify um, 
your institution. Uh, we built this identifier in a feature-facing manner, anticipating that we may use an identifier other than an OPID in the future. Um, but for now, uh, when you enter your institution ID type, um, please select OPEID as that is your only option. And then for the ID value, we ask that you include the full eight-digit OPID. Um, so this is different than what you listed in your file header, where we asked for the six-digit one. Here we're asking for eight-digit OPID, which um, will include two leading zeros and two trailing zeros. I'm going to talk about the student ID briefly. Um, so when you lose these leading zeros, which will happen if you happen to open your file, um, if it's a CSV file and you open it in Excel to make any additional edits to it, um, you will most likely use, lose the formatting if you save your file again. Um, so where this leading zero issue comes in is for both the OPID um, as well as student IDs. Um, I understand that some institutions may have student IDs with leading zeros. So again, just be aware of that and be careful if you open a CSV file and then try to resave it. Um, last, uh, for the enrollment type, um, we reference the common education data standards to define this field. Um, and you'll probably be surprised to see the values of continuing and readmit as um, the valid choices, along with first time and transfer in. Um, again, because we followed that standard, we kept all of those values. Uh, but since you, the cohort um, for PDP is defined as first time and transfer students only, then um, the continuing and readmit values don't really apply, and you can ignore those. Okay, I will pause briefly um, for questions. So we have a question about um, what to do regarding the leading zero um, and how you know the concern is losing the leading zero. Um, so that happens if you, and again, it depends on how you ultimately output your file, whether it's a TXT file or an Excel file, uh, a CSV file, and whether you open it in a text editor or, a, um, or Excel. If you open a CSV in Excel and then resave it, um, you will lose any formatting that you had there. Um, that it, and again, the most likely culprit is the leading zeros. So if that's what you need to do, though, because you know once you create your report, you may have to jump into the CSV to do some additional manual changes. Um, my suggestion would be to kind of save a master Excel file. If you save it as Excel, um, it'll keep any, of for any formatting that you um, have made. And then each time you're ready to submit the file, take your Excel file and save that one as a CSV and then submit the file. Um, and then if you happen to run into any errors or you choose to make any other changes, go back to your master Excel file, make the changes there, and um, resave as a CSV and resubmit. Right. Um, so this slide shows you an example of what the detail record would look like in a text editor. Um, notice the column headers first, which should appear in a single row, um, followed by a student record, which again is a single row. Um, here it appears that there's a space between the two, but um, again, if you were to look at it in a text editor in Excel, there, there won't be any spaces. It just appears this way, um, so it's a little easier to read. And if you had multiple students, um, the column headers would only appear once, followed by um, as many of the student records as you would have in your record. Um, the trailer record is next, um, and this identifies where your data ends. Uh, similar to the header, these are variable names and not column headers. Um, you always populate a static T1 for the record type. You then count every row that is populated in your file, including the various headers and the trailer. And the next slide will show you what that looks like. So if, this, if I were to look at this in Excel, um, I would literally have um, 63 rows of data, and that's what I'm counting here in my trailer. All right, so here, um, again, we see a sample of the entire file uh, viewed in a text editor. Um, we have a file header, followed by the column headers, followed by two student records, and closing with a trailer. And again, remember that for the trailer, we're counting every row, and in this case, we have a five rows of data. Um, one interesting fact here, um, there was a pain point experience in previous submissions, um, and that was in regards to the number of trailing um, commas in the header and trailer. Since we're collecting more data elements in the um, 
column headers and the student um, detailed records than we do in the file header and trailer. Um, both of those will have all these trailing extra commas. Um, we've since made an update to our application where it automatically removes um, all those extra uh, trailing commas at the end of the header and the trailer record. So again, if you were to open, um, save this file and open it um, in Excel and save it as a CSV, and if you were to view it again in a um, text editor at that point, you would see all these um, extra leading, uh, sorry, trailing commas. Um, again, we've updated the application to ignore those, so you don't have to make any changes when you see that. All right, so um, this concludes the keys to creating a successful cohort file. Um, I'll pause again for any questions. All right, so for creating a course file, um, so the course file itself, um, the header is no different than the core file header. Um, say for the record type, you'll notice this is a DCE02, whereas the core file is a DCE01. Um, one key difference, though, between the course and core file is the population of students that are included, um, whereas the core file only contains the most recent population of students that are enrolled at an institution, the course file is cumulative. It captures the most recent courses taken by all students that were previously part of a cohort and still attend your institution. Here is a sample of what the header record looks like. Again, um, no different than the cohort file, save for uh, a different identifier for the file type, which in this case is DCE02. Um, the data elements themselves are not structured any differently than the cohort file. Um, whereas the cohort file was at the student level, again, the course file is at the course level, um, meaning that a student will have multiple records in this file, um, one for each course. So now we'll take a closer look at some um, items of note. Um, so again, for street lines 1 and 2 and city, um, the same maximum character limitations exist for these fields in the course file. Um, also, please note that here we're asking for the current address, whereas in the core file, we're asking for the permanent address of the student. We also have a data element that asks whether a student is a Pell recipient. Um, I wanted to clarify that we're asking this question for a particular term, not if the student was ever a Pell recipient. So this is specific to the term um, for which you're reporting. For degree type sought, um, You'll notice that some of the choices wouldn't really apply to this core population, um, but again, we included them due to standardization. Um, for the sake of completeness, I would suggest mapping your degree types where you can, but ultimately we defer to you and the level of effort you estimate it would take to do so. Um, one uh, very, uh, very important note, um, so a big change that will affect the folks that have already coded their data, um, degree type sought is now a required field. It is no longer optional, and it must be provided for each student. Um, we had a very high response rate for this field in our previous submissions, um, although some institutions elected to, um, during their initial submission, not include this um, data element uh, for their students, um, but after talking to them, they were able to provide it. Um, so, we, so it is now required because it is a key driver for all of our outcomes. Um, and if you don't happen to have this da uh, data point for a particular student, um, again, please look at the allowed values as you will be able to enter um, UK uh, to indicate unknown for a particular student. Uh, it looks like we have a question here. It does not affect past files. Um, again, our success rate was very high for degree type sought. Um, if you have a particular concern, and I'm sorry, I can't tell from here who asked the question, uh, please follow up with us um, at pdpservice at studentclearinghouse.com. Um, and we can take a look at the uh, previous data you have submitted to us. Course CIP, um, that is another example of a field um, where oftentimes leading zeros were lost. So again, just keep this in mind if you're editing your file um, in Excel. And then the course begin and end dates. Um, 
with our last submission, we learned that um, some systems of institutions may not have a um, course date in their particular system. So you can substitute that with your term begin and end dates. Um, that happened on a very limited basis, but if it does happen to you, um, again, you can just follow up with us or you can um, place the term begin and end dates into that particular field. Um, please note one additional change to the course file. And again, this is a big um, change, and we actually have it listed here in the slide. So we've changed the way we're collecting um, course information. It's a subtle change, um, but if you were to resubmit your file as it is today without making um, the necessary change in sequence, your file would actually fail. So please do pay attention to this. Um, we are collecting course identifying information in a new manner, and we've introduced a new field. And then we've also moved up an existing field um, in the sequence. So starting in the course file with sequence um, ID uh, 31, which is now course prefix, that's the new um, column that we've introduced, uh, all the other fields af start after this field will be in a new sequence. So we need to make sure that your files are also following that new sequence. Um, collecting the course information in this more granular manner um, is we're doing that in order to avoid um, duplicate courses. Um, we received, based on what we were, how we were previously collecting it, we were getting some false flags, um, flagging courses as duplicates, um, even though they were not. So we listened to your feedback and are hoping that collecting them in this manner will uh, avoid that issue. Right, um, this is just a sample of what the um, column headers and detailed records will look like. And then the trailer, again, is no different than um, the core file. And that's what the sample would look like. And then here is an entire file. Right, I will pause briefly for questions. Okay. Moving on to the financial aid file. So this is a brand new file. Um, it is optional. Again, whereas the court and course file are um, required, this is an optional file. Um, this is a brand new file whose definition is published for the first time today. Um, this file is, again, optional. Um, similar to the course file, it is cumulative. Um, it is at the student level, and it is meant to capture the most recent data points for all students that still attend your institution. Um, the header record is no different than the other two files. Um, the only difference is that the file is identified as DCE03. Um, and again, the file itself is at the student level, so each student will have a single record in the file. Um, please note that in the definition of the file, we've included an additional column on the far right um, for data elements that can only be pulled from a student's ICER record, we have identified the specific field it can be pulled from. Um, as you explore the submission guide and review the new financial aid file section, um, please don't hesitate to reach out to us at pdpservice at studentclearinghouse.org um, with any questions or concerns you may have. I'll pause briefly here for any questions. All right, um, the trailer to the file will again be similar to the course and core files. All right, um, so the system will um, certainly tell you whether a um, field is required, um, you know, whether, whether a required field is missing or if any field was provided in the wrong format. Um, there are maybe some growing pains um, the first time you submit your file. Um, for those of you who have previously submitted files, you may still, don't be shocked if you still experience some errors um, as you pull in a new population of students. Um, one example I can think of is that student names, perhaps um, you've cleaned up some of the names you previously submitted to us, and as a new um, cohort enters your institution, you um, again may encounter some students that um, may have some special characters that our system doesn't allow. Um, so again, don't be shocked if you run into any type of um, errors when you resubmit your file. Um, the second point uh, 
is the data accurate and is it up to date? So this point is really important. Um, this is an example of an area where your role as a steward of your own data is key. Um, let's consider the cumulative and term GPAs. Um, these look exactly the same from a data perspective and the application would not be able to tell the difference if they were mixed up. But beyond formatting rules, um, our application would not be able to ensure the accuracy of this field. So your data testing um, is key to quality in this situation. So it's really up to you to make sure that you've mapped the fields correctly. And we highly recommend um, comparing your data in your file to the source of the data, um, especially the first time you code it, and definitely kind of spot checking it um, each subsequent submission. I'll pause again for some questions. Uh, we have a question about the financial aid file. Um, that is optional and what the benefits are since to sending them in. Um, by sending that data in, um, we are moving to Tableau. Um, so all the outcomes now in the KPIs will be produced in Tableau. And by having that additional data, we're, we're going to provide you specific outcomes um, with the financial aid data. And you may also be able to cross-reference it with the other data that you submitted. So it's really giving you more valuable um, outcomes and different outcomes that you, what you what we've shared with you in the past. Uh, we have a question about whether um, the user will be notified if some of the data is not accepted or has errors, and you certainly will. Um, the system itself will give you automatic emails, and we're going to go through um, kind of the whole end-to-end -end process in, in the next um, few slides here. Um, but yes, the system will notify you if you have data errors. And um, there's also actually the next level of data quality checks that um, there, there's just people doing that. As the data uh, processes through our, progresses through our system, um, we do data quality checks, and we may even reach out to you um, uh, well after you've submitted your data, once we get to those data points. All right. Um, so most of you may be familiar with the file submission process to the clearinghouse, either through other services or as a participant um, in the previous um, submission to the PDP. Um, we have uh, created a new SFTP mailbox specific to the post-secondary data partnership. Uh, please note that the credentials are unique to the mailbox and not the user. That means that if you want other users to have access to the mailbox, you must share the credentials with them. Um, this mailbox will be created once we receive a data sharing agreement, um, and you will receive automated emails with your ID and password, and we ask that you log in and test it as um, soon as you receive those. All right, so once you've um, reviewed the submission guide, you've coded your files, and now you're ready to submit your files, you would go to the um, Clearinghouse SFTP site. You would use the credentials that we've provided to you, and you would use the upload wizard to um, upload your file. Once you have uploaded for um, your file, um, in a fairly short time after your submission, you will receive an email from the FTP server informing you that your file was picked up. Um, I can't emphasize this enough. Um, this email uh, is just informing you that your file was received. It does not indicate whether it was successful or not. It's simply the FTP server saying we've picked up your file and we've um, sent it onwards. Um, you could have submitted a completely invalid file or even a picture and you would have received the same um, FTP notification. So the application will then send you an email um, indicating that your file was accepted, um, whether it had an error, or whether it has some sort of um, formatting errors. So the application email is really what will indicate your success. There are times where between your um, confirmation email from the FTP server, um, you actually don't get any subsequent emails. That means that, like I said jokingly, um, but if you have submitted an image as an example by accident or a PDF file, um, then our application and sorting system would not be able to read the file in any fashion and understand what application it should go to. In those instances, you would actually not receive any follow-up emails. So if you don't receive the follow-up emails, reach out to the PDP service team and we'll help you um, troubleshoot the file and see what went wrong. Okay. 
Um, so again, once you submit your files, um, please be patient. It can take up to um, one hour for your files to complete processing. In most cases, it's much shorter than that, um, probably more within 20 minutes. Um, but it really depends on the number of records in your file. Um, that'll have a big impact on the timing. Um, so it can be anywhere from that 20 minute to 60 minute mark um, until you receive that second email from the application. Um, and then whether or not you receive that email, um, it's always a good idea to confirm your file status by actually logging into the application and reviewing the file summary page. I'll pause for questions. All right, so reviewing the file status. Um, so we talked about uh, checking the status of your files in the application. Um, and if you recall, your checklist also asks you to test your credentials for the application. So here's how you get there and log in. From the official post-secondary um, data partnership website, please click on the check status, oops, pardon, um, check status uh, of your files hyperlink. You will then be taken to the login page. Log in using your application credentials. These are different than your um, FTP credentials. Once you log in, you will arrive at the file submission summary page. Um, please note that once you land on this page, please bookmark it for your convenience. Um, we're sending you the link now. Um, we'll, we'll make sure to share that link with you um, before the webinar is over. Um, that'll take you directly to the application. Um, go ahead and once you log in, bookmark that page. And then the next time you can just use that bookmark to get directly to the file summary page. Um, so your landing page will have a list of all of your file submissions. Um, at the top of the screen, you'll have some uh, filters. Um, they will allow you to filter and search uh, for specific files. Um, if you find your file in a pending status, um, click on the reset button so that the summary grid updates and you can see the changes in the status of your file. Um, depending on the number of records in your file, this should just take a few minutes. But every once in a while, you may not just see a passed or um, fail, you may see a pending. So that's when you want to um, click on that reset button. That's right next to the search button. Okay, the submission number is a system generated um, ID and it will be included in your email notification sent by the application. Um, your institution's name will be listed here as well, followed by your file type, which is either the cohort or course or financial aid file. The validation status will have a pass, fail, and pending. And again, the pending means that your file is in progress. The file name is the name of your file plus some additional information that we append. Um, the second to last columns list the number of records in your file and should match what you indicated in the file trailer. The very last column then um, displays the date on which the file was received. All right, um, so we've alluded to the potential of receiving errors when you submit your data. Um, there are file formatting validations and data validations. Um, if either of those fails, uh, the status of your file will say failed, and your submission number will become a hyperlink. Once you click on that hyperlink, you will then be taken to this detailed error page. So right now we're looking at a file formatting error. Um, this, this means that there is something wrong with the structure of the file. The error grid here will tell us what field name has the error. It will provide the error message and the proposed solution. The last column will tell you what line number was affected. And this comes in really handy if the error is somewhere amongst the thousands of student records. So it's actually really nice to um, log again into the application and see the actual um, affected line numbers. Um, one item of note, uh, due to the nature of file formatting errors, only a single one is, el is elicited at a time and the application will stop processing and send a notification. Um, this is likely due to um, severe structural errors. So please make your correction and then resubmit your file. Um, now we're looking at data validation errors. So here the error grid will tell us again what the field name, um, the field name that has the error. It will provide the error message. It will tell us how many times an error occurs in the file and list the proposed solution. Um, the last column again will tell you what line number is affected. And here you see an example of uh, multiple lines being affected by, by an error. Um, 
You can use the detach button that you see on this page and it will give you a slightly wider view and you can adjust the column um, width. Uh, you can also actually highlight an individual cell and copy paste all your affected line numbers into a separate document um, if you happen to have a lot of them. Um, from experience, it's seeing an error in the thousands. So if the error count is um, in the thousands, it usually means it's some sort of global, global error in the file creation or mapping. And you most likely won't have to look at every record individually. You can probably just make one global change to them, fix that error. So that brings us to the end of our um, detailed review. Um, thank you for your patience. Uh, I understand it was a lot of content that we went through, and we really appreciate your participation. Um, so we'll just pause for a few moments um, and allow you some time to ask any questions. And then after the Q&A, we want to share some feedback and advice from your colleagues that uh, previously submitted their data to us. And I'll we'll wait for some questions to come in. Um, so here's also a nice checklist to keep on hand for the various steps that will lead to your successful submissions of the files and receipt of the um, outcomes. Um, so the first one, um, obviously, especially for new participants, um, once your agreement signed, return to the clearinghouse. Um, you'll know when you receive a confirmation from the PDP service mailbox if that step is done. Um, if you have not received a confirmation email but expected one, uh, please email us and let us know. Um, if you think that a follow-up from your end is required, please do so as soon as you can. Um, next, we want the questionnaire responses, please. Um, did you complete and send your questionnaire response um, to the PDP service mailbox? Um, again, these will be sent out by the end of the week, and we're hoping to have them back by September 30th. Um, again, for Frontier Set friends, if there's any um, changes to um, your credit threshold, your grade scale, or if you have additional term and information to provide to us, um, please do so. Um, have you prepared for the data submission? So again, review the data definitions. Um, the version history at the very top of the submission guide will capture all the changes that were made since the last time you submitted the data. So this includes the folks that have previously submitted data to us. Please um, look at that carefully and do just um, browse through all the data definitions again. Um, Check your credentials for the SFTP mailbox um, as well as the application. If you have um, received them for the first time, um, please log in and test them. If you haven't used them since your last file submission, please again try to test them and make sure they're up to date and working. Um, begin the development of your files. Um, so likely, even though some data definitions may have looked good on paper, uh, you may notice a discrepancy when developing your files and mapping your data to our format. So again, just want to emphasize that the sooner your de the development of your files begins, um, the sooner we can work together and address any complications you may discover. Um, and again, when you review the financial aid file, if there's any concerns you have about those data elements or the information contained there, please let us know early um, and we'll help address any of your concerns. Um, in step five, we then ask you to submit your files to the clearinghouse, um, then review your file status. If errors exist, please review the resolution and make the necessary corrections and resubmit your files. Um, and then finally, you know, um, you confirm that you have a successful file status. And really, um, between the steps uh, six and eight, um, we're there for you every step of the way. Um, so please do reach out to us if you get stuck on a particular um, file error that you may receive. Okay, looks like we may have gotten a um, few questions in. Uh, yes, the checklist is on our public website, and we may even have a... Um, Correct link? Yeah, we have a link to the uh, public website and it's under the resources section. So you can get this checklist that's displayed right now um, on this slide. You can get it in um, from our public PDP webpage. Um, there's a question about the um, additional webinar. So we will have, um, I believe, two more Q&A sessions. Um, and then we will repeat these webinars again in October as well. But um, it's probably... The audience today will probably get the most value out of those Q&A sessions that are coming up. And they're um, right at the end of the month, I think, right as the submission window opens. Um, September 20th and 26th. 
And then the last question is when the outcome reports will be um, available. These will be available. So for this particular submission, the outcomes will be made available to you in um, 10, well, I don't know if it's tentative or not, but I think March. So not, not tentative, in March they will be available. And uh, excitingly, they will be available to you in Tableau. All right, so just to summarize and wrap up our presentation today. Um, so again, some of the keys to your success is to please um, respond with the questionnaire to us as soon as you can. Um, an early submission in the data submission window is highly, highly recommended. Um, again, once the data goes through the system and you get your checks, we do run it through a data quality framework from our end as well, um, where we run some additional checks. So the sooner we have the data, the sooner we're able to do that. Um, and then, of course, follow the checklist and please um, review um, all the resources that we've provided to you on our public website. Um, I'm just going to leave some of this um, advice from our previous participants here. Um, you may read through them. Um, again, the submission guide has gotten some, although very large in content and volume, um, it's gotten some good reviews um, and it's pretty detailed, so please do take a close look at that. Um, reach out to us early and often. We're here to help you along the way. And you've, with our past submitters, um, and I'm sure with some of the new um, folks as well, um, you've helped us discover things that we need to address. Um, so we certainly appreciate that collaboration. All right, and then we'll do one final call for questions.